Okay, good to go. Um, so yesterday we went over uh, transactions and some of the core um, menu and also uh, importing via system import. Um, so we just went through a couple examples of spreadsheets importing um, a spreadsheet and updating existing items by extracting them out of inventory, changing a particular column and importing it back in to update, um, kind of like a mass change. Um, so we did all that yesterday. It went longer than I thought. <laughs> so for those of you that were on the call yesterday, thanks for bearing with me. Um, it was a two and a half hour uh, training session, but a lot of good information. And like I said yesterday, um, what we're going to do is um, for our inventory sessions, just like um, we did with UCS and payroll, we are going to segment them, breaking them up into the specific areas that we discussed yesterday and linking them to this areas. Now, most of the information you see here in our training page is um, last year's training recordings. So we still need to update those. That's on our to-do list to get that done. Um, so if you do try to reference these links, I think for the majority of these, maybe the accounts has been updated in USAS, but for everything else, it's still reflecting last year's. Um, and we had USAS and payroll last month. So these links will get updated so that um, you can review them. New people coming into your ITC, or giving this information to your districts for you know new people starting in as a payroll uh, position or in an AP or an AR position um, or the treasures, um, they can reference these certain areas and review what we covered during the training. So I think uh, so. What we're going to do, I, I also the recording from yesterday, I did update that. It is underneath the recorded training. So like I said, I'm going to take this and break it down added into here within the next couple of weeks. Um, the overview PowerPoint is out here. Um, based on our training this week, um, I may have to tweak this a little bit. So an updated copy of the PowerPoint will probably be available at the end of the week. Um, but this really has most of, the, of everything that we're going to be covering today. Um, I just may make slight adjustments based on what we cover. Um, that I feel might be important to add to the PowerPoint. So again, um, you may want to come back out here uh, end of the week or early next week if you want to see the updated PowerPoint. And please um, feel free to use this for your own trainings. That's what this is designed for, is a train the trainer PowerPoint um, that allows you guys then to take this information and tweak it and uh, share that with your districts. Um, so where we're at in that PowerPoint is we are on day two, where we're going to talk about inventory reports. Um, so we're going to go into the gap reports in detail. Um, I've got some slides out here that explain uh, where you might see differences um, in the reports. I also have, um, we're also going to cover uh, non-gap. Uh, well, before we talk about non-GAAP, I'm also going to talk about, you know, possible um, reasons why your report balances may not uh, be the same. Your ending balances from a prior year may not match the beginning balances for a new year. Um, we have put a, a huge lockdown on that, um, but um, it, we're, we've put a lockdown on it throughout the year, so you still... These, situations still may creep up. So I want to talk about those. Um, also, uh, we'll talk about some non-GAAP reports, audit report, the book value, um, just some of the bigger ones where we feel like we have tickets come in about, and also the fiscal year and report bundle. And again, when it comes to that, um, I think I have a slide on why a report bundle may not be created and the reasons why. So kind of just like a heads up that, you know, you may want to look at these things as to why the report bundle didn't get created. Now, eventually, uh, we are going to have documents store out there that will no longer, once that is in place, and I don't have a date on that, but once it is, um, the report bundle will be history, um, meaning the email 
emailed to the district. That won't happen anymore. Instead, the report bundle will be out there archived um, and they can look that up in the inventory application, um, the different reports for that year. Um, instead of it having it as a zip file that's been emailed. So, uh, so yeah, so when that document store does come out, um, you know, we will have, you know, more information about inventory and the impact that um, having document store has on the actual uh, inventory fiscal year and report bundle. So more exciting things ahead this year. Okay. So with the gap reports, like I said, um, yesterday, what I did is I really didn't go into the PowerPoint and I actually just demoed, you know, what we're going to do. Um, I may, you know, touch upon a few of these slides at first here, but then I'll get into the actual instance and we'll start running these gap reports. Um, there are some slides in here that are pretty important that I want to cover. Um, but again, we'll do that as well as demoing how to generate these reports and what you're looking at. Um, so um, the gap reports, um, there are four of them in inventory, um, and what they basically are, show those real quick before I talk about these slides. So we have um, like separated out into a separate area um, underneath the reports menu, and um, what we have is the and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm old school. I'm still thinking 101, 102, 103, and 104. So I usually go in that order, which the 101, for those of you that used EIS, um, the 101 was the fixed asset by source report. So it's this one right here. And that means by source, where was it purchased from? What account was used? What purchase order was used? Um, so it identifies the source of the purchase, basically, or, or how the item was acquired. Um, so that's what the fixed assets by source is. Uh, the next one is what we called as the 102 report in Classic is the fixed asset by function slash class report. This report actually has three options in it. Um, It'll allow you to do a generated report by function, and I think within function by the class. Um, and then just by class, and then a summary version of the function within class. Um, so that's um, how that report is generated. Um, was, uh, this report also contains the book value as well. Um, so the book value is the total original cost minus depreciation. That's what a book value is. Um, the third one that we're going to cover is the fixed assets report or the schedule of change in fixed assets. This part schedule of change is very important um, because what this report is basically showing you is what has changed throughout the year um, for your items. Um, and again, all of these reports are your capitalized information. Non-cap items are not going to appear on this report. These are just capitalized assets. Um, so um, we'll get into the schedule of change in fixed assets here in a little bit. Along with that, it's uh, other uh, schedule of change partner, I call them the change schedules, um, is a schedule of change in depreciation. And so this basically is the fixed assets schedule change is showing original cost changes. The schedule of change in depreciation is showing you depreciation changes. It's not including the original cost. It's looking at the depreciation that's been tracked on those capitalized assets and what's taken place during the year. So let's dig into these. Um, so I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint just to talk about some of this. So um, like I had said, um, only capitalized assets are included on the gap reports and only active items. So an active item is an item that has a status of active, new, um, excess asset for sale, excess asset not in use. Now, some of those statuses your districts may never use. Possibly excess asset for sale and excess asset not in use. They've been around forever, um, but it is an, a status and it's considered part of the active items. 
Um, separate uh, report sections are going to be displayed in each of these. Um, oh, sorry, I have to back up here. Only active items will be included. I have an exception here in the change schedules. Sorry about that. Um, so disposed of assets will show um, on the change schedules. And that makes sense because you're showing what has happened during the year. If you disposed of an active item during the year, you want to see that on the change schedule. So those will show disposed of assets that were, you know, that were active as of the beginning of the year. Um, so each, like I said, each uh, section, um, there's governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary sections on each of these reports. So you're going to see that. Um, and that's based off the fund types. So if you go and look up core funds, um, you'll see the fund type sections. And so it knows based on your funds that you've heard in core funds where these need to be placed on the reports. If your 001 fund shows a governmental fund type, then obviously on the reports, those 001 related um, items um, are going to show up underneath the governmental section of the report. Items with least type of operating um, are not included on the reports. Least type of capital, capitalized are, um, are capital lease, but least type of operating are not. Um, also, and this is something that we touched upon yesterday um, when we were going through adding an item, is the entity ID. I was talking about yesterday a lot of um, items, like a lot of chairs or tables, where you don't want to break them up individually because you don't want to have a million tags for, you know, for each chair. You want to keep them as a lot um, with one tag on the system. but because of that lot may be large, it may be over the threshold. And they, if you broke them down, none of those chairs would be considered capitalized. So if you want to purposely exclude that lot off of the gap reports, there is a field on the item called entity ID. And what you can do is you can enter in a keyword in there and that's up to the district. I've seen no gap, non-gap, like that. Um, and so what happens then, you know, it's showing that item is showing is capitalized due to the large amount and probably meeting any other causation threshold. Um, but if you don't want that, you know, considered capitalized, but it really isn't item on your gap reports, each of the gap reports, as well as some of the non gap reports, have um, a prompt at the beginning of the report asking you if you want to include or exclude entity IDs. And that exclude field or prompt will allow you then to put in that specific entity ID. So I would enter in on GAP, that's what my entity ID is, and it will purposely exclude any of those capitalized items that have the entity ID of non GAP in them. Um, so that's. Um, where you know you have that ability to do that. They were able to do that in classic as well. You know, those entity IDs rolled over into redesign. Um, so they are, you know, in there for those items and they can still, you know, run those reports with those same entity IDs and have the same impact. So if you're wondering what makes up um, these fields that are used in the GAP reports. Um, so um, these are the fields that are involved in that. And so um, the fund, obviously, function and asset class, you know, those are considered GAP-related uh, fields. They're all stored underneath core uh, menu. And then with the fund, um, you do need to put in a fund type. And if I go back to my, just to talk about that here, I go under core and funds. So here is, um, here are my funds and here are all the um, information in here. Um, this is um, like old scrambled data. So you may see some kind of odd looking things like this very first one, so just ignore that. Um, but basically everything on down looks pretty normal. Um, and so if you do need to add a fund, the district needs to add a fund, they would use create 
Um, and when they put in the code, which districts generally use the same fund code as they do in USAS, um, and then uh, the description, and then they have to put in a type. Um, is it governmental, proprietary, fiduciary? Those are the three types. Um, so it's definitely gap fields, definitely looking at the core funds, as well as the core functions and the core asset classes. Um, the status, obviously, um, is it active? Um, is it new? Um, you know, stuff like that. So it's definitely looking at the status. It's looking at the original cost, the acquisition method. Um, this acquisition method, especially um, on the um, fixed asset by source report, um, we've got different areas where the purchased information is displayed on the report versus the donated, leased, and other. Um, so, you know, it's going to be looking at that acquisition method in order to know where to place those items amounts on that report. Um, the lease type, as I said, capital leases are included operating or not. Uh, depreciation information. So if you're tracking depreciation on capitalized assets, um, obviously it's looking at all the depreciation information so that it knows uh, where to put that stuff um, on the gap reports acquisition information too. Um, if you dispose of items um, with capitalized assets, if you need to dispose of it, you need to post a disposition transaction. If I, you know, uh, added the item five years ago and for some reason it was destroyed, lost, stolen, whatever, um, I can't just go in and delete it. Um, I need to create a disposition transaction, which is one of the things we covered yesterday in order to, pro to provide a, a good audit trail as to what happened to that item. Um, and so that disposition information is going to show up on my change schedules because I've made a change to that item during the year. So we'll see that on there. Also transfer information. If I create a transfer transaction, let's say I added an item a few years ago and um, I realized that it was under the wrong function. Um, that I can make that change now. I can't go in and just edit the function code and the item won't let me because I'm, I've am i got gap enabled. Um, so I need to create a transfer transaction to move it to the right function code. Obviously when I do that, it's going to be reflected on my change schedule reports um, because I've made a change to that item during the year. Those are all of the fields that are part of the gap reporting. So what we're going to get into now is um, each of those gap reports. And uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the fixed asset by source. And so this is where, you know, these diagrams that we have here are pretty important. And I'm going to try to make this bigger so you guys can see this better. Helps a little bit. All right. Um, and so the fixed asset by source. So like I said, what this is, is I think the, the key word here is by source. Um, so this is going to contain all of your original cost amounts by their source, their acquisition method. Um, the account codes that were used to purchase the item when you when yesterday when we created an item the first thing it took us to was that acquisition window where we had to enter in pull it from the pending file and it pulled in the purchase order information the amount um the at the uh account code that was used to purchase the item that's our source information um so that will help to determine where it gets placed on this report so Purchased items are listed by the source fund code from which the item was purchased from. So that is the fund dimension on the account code. And before we even go further, um, you know, I kind of have a picture here to give you even a better sense. I go into acquisition underneath transactions and I view one of these. And of course, this one doesn't have one. 
Um, but um, this is the source fund I'm talking about here. So this is where this is at. And if you're asking why doesn't this have one, um, it's because it doesn't have to have a, a source fund code. Um, this isn't a required field. Um, in classic, um, you could have had lots of items that didn't have um, information in here. The main reason why this may not be in here is either one, um, they didn't pull it from the pending file, they created them manually, or they created items through a spreadsheet. So when you create an item via a spreadsheet, it doesn't have the ability to collect all this information. It basically stores the tag, the acquisition type or the type, the date, and the amount. That's it. Um, so if you wanted to put that stuff in, you'd have to put it in later by going into the acquisitions, extracting them out, and loading that information in. That's why it's so nice to be able to pull a pending file because it pulls all that information in. Um, but yeah, I mean, based on what they had in classic and what got migrated over, you'll probably have several items that either may not even have an acquisition because it's that old and for some reason it never had one on the system um, or the acquisition has a very little information, um, just the required fields basically. Um, so I wanna explain what happens when you either have a fund code in here or you don't and how that report works. That's what we're gonna talk about on these slides here. Um, but just, you know, going back here, the purchased items, which are all of these from classroom furniture down to 466, are items um, that it was purchased funds. So it's looking at that, if it has one, that fund dimension, and it's labeling it on here. Okay, so that's where that's coming from. So if, you know, you run a fixed asset by source, and you're like, where are these coming from? Um, that's what it's coming from. It's coming from the acquisition record based on the source fund, not the asset fund, the source fund from the account that was used to purchase the item. Acquisition methods of donated, leased, and other have their own areas in the um, on the report. So any items that are marked, capital, leases, donations, or other, when you created that item, those amounts will be placed in this area. Everything before that here is all considered purchase, which is the majority of the items that they get are purchased items. Um, then what you're gonna see is an acquisitions prior to system startup. And you're like, well, where is that coming from? Well, that's what we're going to cover here in these next few slides. We're gonna look at the behind the scenes of how this report works. Okay, I'm sorry if this is a little blurry, it is to me, um, but we do have this out here in the documentation as well. So if you want to look at the documentation, I've got the same image on there. Um, and so these are, I'm just going to take you through a few scenarios of why, you know, you might find or where or how it originates the amounts underneath acquisitions prior to system startup. So in this example, let's say there is a, a tag out there, a capitalized asset, where the fund dimension on the acquisition record is blank or zeros. So what the system does behind the scene, it goes, okay, there's nothing here, where do I go? It goes over to the asset fund and will then reference the asset funds fund type. So it looks and says, oh, well, this you know item, when I added it, um, even though I didn't have an actual account um, that was, you know, that I entered in here or it's been referenced, maybe this is 10 years old, who knows? Um, but when that item was added, it was added under the general fund. Um, and so it goes and looks at the general fund. And then from there, it's determining where now do I place this on the report? So from the general fund, it looks at the funds type underneath core funds. So if I would go and look up the general fund underneath core funds, um, the type is governmental. 
So it knows exactly where to place that in my report underneath the governmental fund type section of the report. But because I don't have a source fund, it, it can't label it underneath any of these areas. So it throws it into the acquisitions prior to system startup. So that's you know one of the reasons where amounts end up in here. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen acquisitions prior to system startup, just like the one we see right here that are in millions. Um, and they've been that way forever. Um, and obviously, um, that hasn't been an issue, um, with, um, audits or anything like that. So, um, districts, we do have in the documentation, how you can fix this so that they show on the right <clears throat> um, field, but that would that would require a lot of work. And at this point, if it hasn't been a concern, um, then it's probably something that the districts don't pursue, um, just because it's you know still part of their fixed assets. It's still in here. It's just um, doesn't show precisely the account that it came from. It, it could be thirty years old. So, you know, at this point, that might be a moot point. So, um, so a lot of districts just, you know, are fine with how things look with this. So this is one reason why it would show up underneath acquisitions prior to system startup. Another reason um, is if, again, the fund dimension is blank um, or zeros, it, again, we'll go look at the fund for some reason, if that, and this doesn't happen a whole lot, you know, this where the fund is blank, it shouldn't. Um, and again, it redesign inventory does not allow an item to be added without a fund. Um, so this could be a carryover from classic migration. So if the asset fund is blank as well, then it doesn't know where to go. So it's going to put it into the fund type area of unknown on the report. We got fiduciary, proprietary, general, and we've got um, unknown. So, um, or I'm sorry, fiduciary, proprietary, governmental, and unknown. Those would be the four sections of the report. So we'll put it in there. And because there is no source fund, it's going to put it underneath the acquisitions prior to system startup underneath the unknown fund type. So um, again, we've got ways that those can be fixed if they need to be. Um, this that's a little bit of a concern that there's no fund. Um, so an easy way to fix this is, um, you know, being able to, you know, we'd have to determine where that was coming from. And like I said, that's in our documentation and creating a, a uh, transfer to transfer it to the correct fund. Um, so that way it throws it into that area um, of the report instead of in the unknown area. So those are two ways with the account code being blank or zeros. Now, um, in this example, we do have an account code. So we do have an actual account that was used to purchase this item. So if the acquisition contains that fund dimension and that fund dimension is listed underneath core funds. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at the type and say, oh, okay, this goes underneath the governmental area of the report. And because I've got a related fund code, it's going to display that in here and put that amount include that underneath this area. So that's a, a pretty simple one. Um, is it common that the account code used to purchase it is also going to be a fund code? It may not be, um, but in this situation it is. So and this is how it behaved in classic. Um, and we're just repeating that same behavior in um, inventory. So the last one I'm going to show you is, um, again, there is a fund uh, underneath the account code, 
And also um, the fund um, is also, it's when I go and look first to see if it's under core funds, it isn't. So O10 is not a core fund. So it doesn't know what to do at that point, right? So what it's going to do is it's going to go now look at the asset fund and say, okay, it's general fund. And from there, then it's going to go out there underneath core funds and look for the general fund, which is their governmental fund type. It's going to place that underneath the governmental section of that report. And it's going to take that O and O and put it in here. And you notice it doesn't have a description because those descriptions are coming from core funds. So if you're questioning too, why you see some, um, you know, purchase areas of the fixed asset by, by source that have a description and some that don't, this is why. It's because it, it's not underneath core funds yet it is included on the acquisition. And so I'm gonna put it in here but this is basically telling me I don't have a core fund for this, which they don't have to put one in if they don't want to, um, but it's referencing the actual source fund. So hopefully that helps. Um, and it's probably more of a, um, a tool for, you know, the districts as well, if they're questioning this or the auditors, if, you know, there are newer auditors auditing and kind of want to find out what's going on with these reports you know, re referencing that documentation, like I said, it's the same images are in that documentation, giving them that chapter, and they can read through that to understand the behind the scenes of how this report is working. So tell you what, um, it's, to me, it's finally nice to know exactly how this works. Um, you know, it's always been like a little bit of a struggle to kind of figure out where exactly are these getting pulled from? And, um, it's nice to see the behind the scenes as to exactly how this works. So that is the uh, fixed asset by source. So like I said, it's all related on the acquisition information. You know, what do they have? This report will pull that into, um, or all that acquisition information will get pulled into this report. Okay. If you guys don't have any questions, I'm kind of watching the chat. I'll go ahead and I'll move on to the next gap report. And that is the fixed asset by function and class. Before I do, just to get you a little familiar, before I step on to the next report here. Again, if I go to my fixed asset by source that we just talked about, and I just generate it, here's that include and exclude entity IDs if I wanted to exclude lots. Um, uh, tags that are, that are lots, then I could do that. And I'll just go ahead and pull this up. And again, here's the breakdown by type, fiduciary, governmental, proprietary, uh, and unknown. So you'll notice too, excuse me, underneath the unknown here, it's still gonna, it's still going to um, include it, even though I don't have any amounts underneath unknown. So, and as you can see, I have a lot of areas amounts in my acquisitions prior to system startup for each of these. So, it was probably carried over from classic. Okay. The fixed asset by function and class. So, like I said, there are three different areas or options, I should say, in this report. And if I go back, and go to the fixed assets by function and class. Here are the three. Schedule by function and class, schedule by class, and a summary of by function and class. So the class is just showing by asset class, basically. Where these two show function and, and class um, in more of a detailed format here, whereas more of a summary format here. And again, this report also has uh, the ability to include or exclude entity IDs. So um, with the schedule by function and class and the schedule by class, um, they will include the original cost amounts and the book value. So um, 
with the schedule by function in class. It sorts by, it subtotals by function, and then it sorts by asset class within each function. So again, it's looking at the items um, on the capitalized items on file that have a function and a class defined in them, which they all should. Um, and then it's just manipulating that into the proper areas on this report. So the schedule by class is just by class only. There's no function sorting in this. So it's a very clean report. <clears throat> if they have six asset classes out there, it's basically going to give them six totals on the report. And then the summary by function and class um, is more of a summarized version. The asset columns are displayed, or I'm sorry, the asset classes are displayed in columns across the report and subtotaled by function. It even, the summary comes into place because you can even summarize by the first two digits of the function. So if they have a bunch of function codes out there, 1111, 1112, 1120, and they want it to summarize by just 1100, um, they can check that to summarize by those first two digits. Um, and then with this one too, it doesn't include original cost and book value on the report at the same time. They have to run those separately. So if they want to want to run a report of summary by function in class, just the original cost amounts, they can do that. Then they can rerun the report for book value. So it doesn't display both like the other two options do. And like I said uh, before, book value is original cost minus the total depreciation. Total depreciation is life to date plus fiscal to date. That's total depreciation. And so I go back. Okay. So I'm going to run one of these reports first, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that you may see. Um, and it just depends on how things are set up for the district. So I'm just going to go in and I'm going to run it by that first option, schedule by function in class. Generate this. <clears throat> And so for this, like I said, this option of the report shows me each function and then its subtotals by um, asset class in each one. And again, it breaks it down just like the fixed asset by source by the different types. Here's my governmental ones. And here's my fiduciary. And here's my proprietary. Now remember, it's looking at, you know, the actual fund codes, that's where these different types are coming from, governmental, proprietary, fiduciary. So it's looking at the funds uh, tied to those accounts, the asset fund to determine where am I going to place it in this report. So, um, you know, if I look at the uh, 006 fund and I have a bunch of capitalized assets for that, um, you know, my 006 fund, when I look at core funds, is the proprietary fund. Type. So those amounts are going to appear underneath this, you know, proprietary area. And it looks like the only function code related to that is the 3120. Um, and so it just then, you know, and the only asset class that's tied to that is fixtures, furniture, and equipment. So again, it's looking at the entire information on the account or on the item to determine where am I going to put this on the report. So in here, I don't see any unknown or acquisitions prior to system startup and stuff like that on here. And I want to explain if you come across certain things, which with this report, you may come across an invalid function or invalid class. Um, so not the other ones, but definitely some uh, invalid function or invalid classes might be one of the things that you uh, Another one that you might encounter is an undetermined section. So go back to this one. So if you do get a call from a district saying, you know, I'm running the schedule of fixed assets by function and class and I'm getting an invalid function. Um, and again, you know, it subtotals first by the function codes, right? And then from there, the underlying asset classes, it sorts through that. 
So you're, you know, they're going down looking all, they see all their function codes and they come across an invalid function. So, you know, they're like, where is this coming from? Um, and we do have this documented as to how to resolve this. So if that associated item is missing a function, or they may get this from an invalid asset class as well, might have an invalid asset class or invalid class um, message as well. And that is because there's a missing function or a missing class um, underneath the core menu. Um, when that happens, then the amounts appear under invalid. So if I would look up this particular, if I did a filter in the items grid for active items, because that's what I'm looking for, just active items for the gap reports, I got to look for capitalized. So I mark my capitalized as true. And I'm like, something needs to help me out here to find this. Well, it was found under the 0101 asset class. So I'm going to filter on that. And I'm going to look for any blank functions then, any items that may have a blank function. And I found it, tag number 800,000 um, does not have a function. Why does this happen? It shouldn't happen with inventory. It may be a byproduct of classic again. Um, so um, if, you know, and that, that was part of the migration um, steps we had to with inventory is to make sure that none of the capital, capitalized assets um, have a blank asset class fund and function. Um, but if for some reason that was missed, um, then it, this still can be corrected. So um, basically to resolve this, you're going to create a transfer transaction uh, to move this amount uh, for this asset into the proper function code. And that will clear it up and you won't see this invalid function message under the report. Um, another one that you may see is an undetermined section. Um, and so just kind of looking at this, um, this is again, a schedule of fixed assets by function and class. And so I'm seeing undetermined. So there's governmental, proprietary, fiduciary, and undetermined. So I'm like, instead of unknown, it's called undetermined in here. Um, and so where's that coming from? And so again, what will help me out is the function codes underneath here. So I can again, filter on the items grid and find that information. So I can filter by um, the 1110 and try to find um, where this um, information's at. So filter the items grid for active capitalized, just like we did before and enter the function or maybe the asset class listed underneath the undetermined amounts. And then review the funds associated with those items. And then, so for this one, 507 pops up. So I probably should check out the 507 fund underneath core funds to see if it's got a missing fund type, because um, that's what's missing. It doesn't know where to put this because it's not under governmental proprietary or fiduciary. So once I go in and edit underneath core funds and add the proper type, this will go away and it will take that information and post it properly to the right area of the report. So easy fixes. Um, again, I, you know, as to what this doesn't happen a lot. Um, again, it still could be an issue with, um, the way things moved over from classic, um, most of that you know, information is not an issue in, in inventory. Uh, you go in, create a, a fund underneath um, core funds. Um, it it has to have a type. I won't let you add it without a type. So, um, so yeah. So that's um, just another thing that can be resolved in case you know you do run into those questions from your districts. Okay, so I've taken care of the first two reports. Um, and I'm going to go back. Um, and the next two we're going to focus on um, are the change schedules, is what I call them. Um, we got the schedule of change in fixed assets and the schedule of change in depreciation. 
And so I'm going to touch upon uh, the uh, fixed asset one, which was called the 103 in classic first, and then we'll go into depreciation. So, um, and as I had stated earlier, I, they're called a change schedule for a reason. Um, it's showing you what has happened during the course of the year to your capitalized assets. So it's in a column format um, and it's showing, you know, what was acquired during the year, what was uh, disposed of, uh, what was moved via transfer and any adjustments. And in these reports, you can sort by asset class funder function. So if I want to generate a schedule changed in fixed assets by asset class, I would select that. Um, also with these reports, it allows you to generate a summary or detail report. Um, and so I want to show you that before we start getting into the nitty gritty of the report. And so I am going to go into my schedule change in fixed assets. And here's where we're talking about the different options. I can do a report by fund, by function, or by asset class. And then um, I can do the include or exclude entity IDs. And here is if I just want a summarized version, which does not show the items that the tag numbers that make up those amounts is just a summarized version of it, then I can check mark summary. Um, if I want a detailed version, I leave this unchecked and it's going to show me the tags that make up those columns with, changed, uh, with changes that took place that year. The acquisition column, okay, I've got an amount of $100,000 underneath um, the 006 asset class underneath my acquisitions column. Where did that come from? What's making up the 100,000? A detail report will tell me that because it will list all the items, all the tag numbers that make up that $100,000. Um, so that's the big difference between summary and detail. And I do have some already pre-generated that I'm gonna show you guys, um, especially when we talk about ending balances and beginning balances. Um, so, well, what? We've made a lot of updates this year and improvements um, in regards to the gap reports. Um, you know, we've made a lot of improvements within the last couple of years. And one of the bigger improvements we made was a locking down that infamous beginning balance. Um, you know, Classic allowed the beginning balances to be changed too. Um, if they did a cap capitalization threshold change, um, it affected the beginning balances. So districts would have to save the EIS cap report from Classic as a backup to show the auditors, this is why um, I made the change. And if they don't save that report, they don't have proof as to why those changes were made. And then they gotta go and find out why. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, discussed this with the auditors too. Why, you know, I don't, you know, we we have so many questions and tickets because auditors are seeing that those balances are changing. And I, you know, with, for good reason. Um, so what can we do in the software to prevent beginning balances from being changed? And so we have painstakingly, um, you know, tried to fix this in inventory so that prevents the getting balances from being changed. If I go in and change my cap threshold, let's say, you know, it's at 5,000, uh, or let's say, yeah, let's say it's at $5,000 right now, and I change it to 6,000, that, the, you know, I'm going to have tags that are no longer considered capitalized because I increase the capitalization threshold. So what Classic used to do is subtract that stuff off the beginning balance. And then you're like, well, what? now it no longer matches my ending balance from the prior year. So where that information should show up is under adjustments. And so, you know, that was one of the things we fixed this year is um, if you do a cap threshold, is for it to not affect the beginning balance. Instead, place those amounts underneath the adjustment column 
And then guess what? Your detail report will show all the tags that were affected from the cap threshold that make up those amounts underneath the adjustment column. So it provides the audit trail right there. Um, and so I kind of wanted to mention that because it's been a big deal uh, this last year. Now there could be other things, not so much in original costs, but there could be some issues with balancing um, depreciation. And we'll get into that when we talk about, um, when we talk about that coming up here with the um, schedule change in depreciation. Um, but, you know, we are still coming across every so often a ticket from somebody regarding beginning and ending balances. Um, some of them, it's because maybe the district hasn't even really, they migrated over, but they haven't really done much with their inventory since then. And now they're coming across this stuff because they're comparing it to maybe classic reports and things like that. Um, you know, what could have, you know, or maybe um, the district reopened uh, a fiscal year, started posting a bunch of capitalized assets and closed it again. Yeah, your balances are not going to match anymore because you made more changes. Um, so it's just stuff like that that uh, we'll talk about and get into later. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to go into what you are seeing on these reports. Um, and so the summary report, you know, some of you, if you're really new to this, um, you're like, where is this stuff even coming from? You know, when I'm looking at a summary report. And so with this example here, um, oops, I, I uh, have, um, I sorted it by asset class. So that's why you're seeing these asset classes here. And so obviously it pulls in the description of the asset class. And then from here, um, the beginning value, what does that mean exactly? That beginning value column is looking at the beginning values of those capitalized assets at the beginning of the year. It's looking at those original cost amounts. So when you look up an item, and I'll take you to that. I'm going to go with an items grid. And I'm just going to look at an active item here to look at something more recent. So let's look at an active item here. Yeah, I need something a little bit later, earlier than that. Here we go. And I'm going to look for capitalize. And I'm going to do a view here. So when an item gets created and, um, you know, and so I'm in, let's say I'm in 2024 and I create an item, this beginning balance will be zero and it will stay zero until I close the year because it was not part of the inventory at the beginning of the fiscal year. So once I close the year, the system will go out there and mark whatever the original cost is as the beginning balance. This figure then is included in here. It's included in the beginning balance if it is a capitalized active asset. So um, that's where that's coming from. And then throughout the year then, I'm making, I'm adding items, I'm disposing of items. So any capitalized item that I entered um, or I entered additional acquisitions to existing items to cause the item to now be capitalized will be displayed underneath the acquisition amount. Um, any disposed of items. So these were items that were part of the beginning balance beginning of the year because they were active. During the year, I disposed of that. I posted a disposition transaction to it. Um, what happens then is that original cost of that item then shows up in the disposition amount. So basically, it is here, and now it's getting subtracted out of here, basically negating it. So by the end of the year, that item is no longer on the uh, schedule of change in fixed assets. 
the transfer in and transfer out. Uh, we touched upon this a little bit yesterday. Um, so if I, you know, have um, the wrong uh, asset class on an item and I need to change it, I can create a transfer transaction. And when I do that, the original incorrect asset class is going to show up on the transfer out and the correct asset class it was transferred into will show up on the transfer in um, and that's where that information gets stored. So this really is um, basically when you perform a transfer transaction is when you'll see that show up in these two columns. Now the adjustment is going to include amounts for transactions that may have their air adjustment flag set. And like I had said earlier, it may also include amounts for items that change their capitalization threshold during the year. No longer affect that beginning value. Um, those type of things will be displayed in here as well. Um, I'm looking here to see, I added, purposely added some notes, I did. Um, and I left them in the, um, PowerPoint so that you guys can reference this, but it just is noting again, what could happen, um, you know, if an item uh, capitalization status changes during the year, whether the cap threshold changed or whether maybe an additional acquisition was done to either increase it so it becomes capitalized or decrease the item's amount so that it no longer is capitalized, what kind of impact does that have on the schedule of change in fixed asset? So I just kind of made notes to that in here. Um, so in here, if an existing item has an additional acquisition entered during this year, changing an item from non-cap to capitalized, that additional acquisition amount is going to appear. So let's say I changed an item from 4,000 to 5,000 um, by adding an additional acquisition of $1,000. Well, now the item's capitalized. So what happens? So the $1,000, the additional acquisition amount will appear underneath the acquisition column and the rest of the amount, the additional $4,000, will appear as a positive adjustment under the adjustment column. So you got the 1,000 here, you got the 4,000 here. It is now included and will be part of the ending balance. Obviously it's not in the beginning balance because it wasn't a capitalized asset at the beginning of the year. It became capitalized during the year. So that's what you know that's doing. Um, if And same thing, if I had an additional negative acquisition causing an item to no longer be capitalized, well, in that case, that item was included in the beginning balance, right? Because at the beginning of the year, it was um, in there. Um, so because we're not impacting changing the beginning balances anymore, what happens is a negative adjustment for the entire amount of that item will be placed under the adjustment column if it's no longer capitalized. Um, so that way it basically shows that it was included. Now it's a negative adjustment and it you know, basically negates and is no longer going to be on uh, the report at the end of the year. So it shows what happened and then next year, it's no longer part of the, big, the balance um, and it will not be part of the next year's uh, schedule change in fixed assets. Um, here's an example if the capitalization criteria was run. So like I said, if um, they increased the current threshold so that an item has now changed from cap to non-cap. So I had a bunch of items at the $4,000 threshold that were capitalized. Well, I just increased it to 5,000. I've got, I could have hundreds of items within that four to $5,000 range that are no longer gonna be capitalized. What happens? Doesn't touch the beginning balance anymore. Those are going to appear as a negative adjustment amounts. 
and vice versa, if you decrease the capitalization, they'll be show as positive because you had items that um, were um, not capitalized that are. So, um, or no, that weren't and now are capitalized. So um, those are gonna show as positive adjustments. So all of this is listed here and I believe we have it in the documentation as well. Just good notes um, in case you know, you do have a training with your districts um, to discuss the gap schedules in further detail. You've got this information, so it makes more sense to them and also may be helpful um, for auditing purposes. So like I said, we this has been um, an ongoing um, and you know stuff that we've worked on, ongoing issues with and within the last couple of years that we have figured out and we feel that we've got it basically good to go where, um, you know, for the most part, unless there's certain circumstances um, where, you know, these beginning balances are locked down and that will help tremendously uh, when the districts are trying to tie out ending balances from the prior year to beginning balances for the new year. Any questions about the schedule of changed in fixed assets? And like I said too, you know, if they are running stuff like the cap threshold where a lot of uh, um, items were affected and you see a very large adjustment amount because of that, no worries. Because what you can do then is you can run the report again using the detail option. And the detail option is going to provide um, the um, tag numbers that make up those adjustment amounts. So it's a, it's a really good audit trail for them. Just back down here. Um, when it comes to the, and I'm gonna go back to my reports here. When it comes to the gap reports, the fixed asset by source, the fixed asset by function class, and the schedule of changed in fixed assets, all those have a key word right there, fixed asset, I'm thinking original cost, um, they all report the original cost amount. And I know like the schedule of change in, uh, or the fixed asset by function class also provides the book value, but we won't worry about that until we get to depreciation. Um, but if you need to balance, and I believe auditors do, they will balance those three reports um, to ensure that the same original cost amounts, the totals are showing up the same. Um, and so I just marked that in that the grand total for all funds um, on those following reports should match because they all contain the original costs. Um, it worked that way in Classic as well. And here is just a, kind of a screenshot of that. So... I have up here original cost figures should balance among these following reports. And I created a schedule of fixed asset by source. And then I ran the schedule of fixed assets by function and class. Those that second report three different ways. And then um, I also ran the uh, summary schedule of change in fixed assets, the three different ways by class, fund, and function. And you'll note that the amounts, the original cost amounts, the totals all balance each other. Okay. If you don't have any other questions regarding the schedule of changed and fixed assets, hopefully that helped um, better understand, you know, get a better understanding of um, that particular change schedule report. The other change schedule report we're going to talk about is the schedule of change and depreciation, which we called the 104 in Classic. And this is not showing original cost amounts. This is showing depreciation amounts. So obviously, 
in order for um, capitalized items to appear on here, they have to be tracking depreciation. Um, and so the reports look very familiar to the schedule changed in fixed assets. You have a summary report and you have a detail report. Um, and again, you can sort by asset class, fund, and function. So um, most of the columns that you see in here are very similar to the ones that you see on the fixed asset change schedule. Um, so let's just kind of talk about some of these here. Um, so first off, I sorted this by asset class. Um, so that's where we're seeing the different asset classes here and their descriptions. So the beginning depreciation is the current life to date as of the beginning of the year. So it is the life to date amount at the beginning of the year. This is, which is last year's, uh, you know, end of life to date depreciation um, for all active capitalized assets at the beginning of the fiscal year. So that's where this is coming from. So if I would go and look at a particular item at the very beginning of the year, and uh, the life to date shows, um, uh, you know, $5,000 on it, that $5,000 is included in this beginning depreciation. So during the year, for those items that you haven't done anything to, they're just sitting there, um, but they're collecting more depreciation, right? Um, there is a content there on the fiscal to date depreciation for those items will fall underneath continuing items. So continuing items are not new items that you added or items that you disposed of. It is items that are out there that um, are just collecting another year's worth of depreciation. So the fiscal to date um, will fall underneath here. If you added any items this year that you're tracking depreciation for, um, obviously it's looking at that beginning depreciation date underneath the item to determine uh, how much needs to be dis displayed here. Um, but that, um, those new items will fall underneath the acquisition. And again, remember, this is just depreciation, not original costs. And then anything that you disposed of during the year is going to show up underneath the disposition. So we got to think about this one because I have an item out there that um, I've got um, that's been out there for years. And the current life to date, let's say, is $5,000. And maybe its yearly um, depreciation is $500. So when this gets disposed of, you know, the 5,000 is showing here and the 500 for the, for the fiscal to date is in here. So if I'm going to dispose of the item, I have to remember that both the life and fiscal to date amount need to be included in that disposition in order to negate that so that it's no longer considered um, a item on the schedule change in depreciation. It's been disposed of. I'm not tracking depreciation, obviously, anymore on it. So you want, you know, that this disposition amount is going to include the beginning life to date and the fiscal to date for that item and putting it in here. So again, it's subtracting it out of here. I don't know if I said that on the last slide, and I apologize. The way that this calculates is it takes beginning depreciation plus continuing um, or takes the beginning depreciation plus continuing items plus acquisitions minus anything disposed of plus anything transferred in anything transferred out gets subtracted out plus any positive or negative adjustments are going to be here to equal your ending balance. So the schedule of change in fixed assets works the same way. Um, obviously it doesn't have the continuing item column, but the calculations work the same. So um, transferring, again, um, that information is going to show up underneath the transfer in and transfer out. 
And then we have our air adjustment. Again, this works very similar to what we saw with the prior report is um, it's going to include possibly any items where the air adjustment flag was set um, or if their capitalization threshold has changed. So again, you're not wanting to affect beginning depreciation, put a lockdown on that um, and want to avoid affecting that um, because, uh, you know, it's just, you have a, people have a lot of questions on that. So um, we're trying to prevent that. And if things crop up, obviously, um, that's where you guys create a ticket and we'll look into it further. Um, but, um, you know, it's what we're kind of hard at working is to ensure that those differences are included on the air adjustment, not affecting the beginning balances. And when, and I, I know this has been a question in the past uh, because I know auditors have asked this as well. Um, and I think this is what they do is they go in and balance um, the schedule of change and depreciation with the book value uh, because your book value is also your depreciation information. Obviously the book value, you can include cap and non-cap items. Um, so when you're running these reports and comparing the balances, you do have to be careful and accommodate for that in the book value. Um, if you run the book value for everything, it's not going to match your, your schedule changed in depreciation because de the schedule change in depreciation is only including capitalized assets. So you have to be mindful that the book value is only including capitalized active assets as well when you run it to compare it against um, the change schedule, the depreciation change schedule. Um, also, uh, the fixed asset by function and class, it has a book value as well. So that should also match um, the schedule changed in depreciation and the book value showing the book value column showing on the book value report. So I do have a screenshot here of the three reports. So you can kind of see uh, what's going on with these. And um, so the first one is the schedule change in depreciation. So obviously my totals, I'm looking at the totals when I'm comparing these, that balance, that amount should match a book value that I run for capitalized assets um, for the year. Um, and that would be the total depreciation column I'm looking at because remember, my ending depreciation is really my life to date, which is my beginning depreciation, plus my fiscal to date, plus any changes that took place to give me, this is what my ending balance is for the year. So this should match this. And then my book value on uh, the book value report, which is my um, original cost minus my total depreciation should match the book value on my schedule of change by class or whatever, or, you know, or the other uh, report that you run that shows the book value in the schedule of change um, of fixed assets. So, um, so yeah, so those are ways that, you know, districts um, and auditors can compare the values. Um, also, you know, just kind of looking at this, the original cost here should also match the original cost on the book value too. Um, so, you know, these all should be agreeing with one another um, when you're running these reports. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Just soaking it in, right? All right, the next thing we're gonna cover is um, some non-GAAP reports. And um, I'm not gonna cover them all. Um, I'm just gonna cover the ones, like I said, we've had more questions on. And uh, one thing I um, put in here, I put this in last year and I kept it in this year, um, is to think outside the box. Um, not all the inventory reports are gonna behave like they did in classic. Um, and 
So it, I think it's just there's but there's more flexibility in inventory, right? Because you've got the grids, um, you've got ways to filter and pick what you need in order to run a report. Or now that we've added spreadsheet capabilities on most of these reports, and then obviously our grids um, also have spreadsheet capabilities. Um, you can extract what you want out of those filter grids and generate a report of your own. Um, you know, I don't, I know we don't have an insurance values report, but you can get that information through our grids um, to get what, you know, the districts need. Um, so, you know, we are continually making um, report improvements in inventory. We have um, several outstanding issues uh, regarding and feedback issues. So, um, you know, as an ITC person, um, you know, if you um, are a member of the steering committee or you know of the person that's representing your ITC, if it's a district person, um, review those feedback issues, too, that are out there for inventory. Um, because if there are ones sitting out there that, you know, have been pretty critical, you feel like, boy, it really would be nice to get that on the roadmap for the next year. Um, let them know. Let the steering committee member know so that, um, you know, and maybe, you know, have them pull the, the other districts in the ITC to see how beneficial this feedback issue may be so that we can, you know, put it on there. You know, the steering committee kind of drives what we um, do as enhancements for the next year. Um, so if you feel that there are some uh, existing JIRA issues that haven't been marked for a roadmap um, or, um, you know, and you can look that information up on um, the JIRA dashboards um, or you feel like there's feedback issues, you know, you can see those as well um, and look those over. And if there's something you feel is, you know, something that would really be helpful, um, then let the steering committee member know so that they can uh, mention that um, at the next meeting. So um, just some of the outstanding issues that I feel like um, are major ones, maybe not major ones, but ones that have probably, um, we have a little more um, people interested in. I know that um, our location worksheet, we report, we do have um, some, a couple outstanding issues, uh, inventory 512 um, about problems with sorting improperly. Um, and that is scheduled for the 2024.3. Right now we are currently working on the 2024.2. Um, they're, they're testing that right now. Um, so it will be on the next uh, release. So for those of you that have sent in tickets about sorting issues with the location worksheet, uh, those should be resolved with that JIRA issue. Um, I know another one that's been out there for a while that we're seeing is inventory 241 regarding the wrong time zone listed on the reports. So if that's been an issue that you would like to see resolved on an upcoming roadmap, something that you may want to talk to your steering committee member about. Um, and I know there's some other ones sitting out there adding a REST service to verify the vendor name and number when you actually go in to create the acquisition portion of the item to say, you know, you, right now you can put whatever you want in there. Um, and it doesn't go out there and USAS and validate that USAS vendor. Um, so you do have to be careful. You're pulling from the pending file. That's no big deal because it's coming from USAS and we know those are valid. But if you're entering those items manually, you do have to be careful about that because it doesn't check USAS when you're entering in them, them in manually. So those are just some of the um, issues that um, we have sitting out there a lot less than the issues that we had last year at this time. So um, that's a good thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and talk about some of these um, uh, non-GAAP reports. And the first one is the audit report. Um, and so this is just kind of a screenshot of the audit report. You have a demand and an official. And the only difference between demand and official in the inventory 
application is that the official provides a signature. Um, I know that in Classic, the official report generated um, and only contained um, audit information from the last time the official report was run. So if a district ran an official report in June and then ran another one in October, it's only going to contain everything from July through October. Um, so it, you don't have that in here. Um, it is a little more flexible because it does um, allow you to put in uh, certain date ranges in here. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and I'm showing this information over here, is the actual report types. So if I wanted to run an audit report on um, the item information, it's it's not showing me um, by the actual transaction processing program, okay? So if I went in and changed the life to date figures um, by going in and running depreciate, um, I don't have a depreciate option in here. Um, when I run depreciate, it affects the life to date depreciation and the life to date depreciation is on the item record. So if I want to see that information, I would have to run this report by item. And then it will show me those life to date changes. It'll show up, you know, what the value was before and what the value is after. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is that it's not by program or option that you ran. It's basically by, you know, the different um, codes and uh, the different, you know, I guess more of like uh, some of the trans the transaction programs per se. Um, another one would be user. If you went in and created a bunch of, um, created some user accounts and you want to generate a report of those, um, you know, this one is a little bit easier because you can specify, I want to see user and it should go out there and generate that information. Um, so those are the report types. Um, you can also generate a report for a specific tag. I know one outstanding issue we have is the start and stop dates. It requires you to enter them in every time you run audits. Well, if you want to just run a report of just a certain tag and you don't know, you know, the tag could be very, you know, quite a few years old. Um, and you're like, I don't know my beginning and ending. I just want to find everything. At this point, you still have to be a little creative. You can put in the tag number, but you have to put in a start and ending. So just go back a couple of years and add a beginning and ending date, and that should cover everything. Um, one thing to keep in mind is any of the auditing that took place in Classic did not carry over to, to the inventory system. It's just going to show you everything that has happened to that item since it's been in inventory. So if you have an item that, um, you know, you created back in Classic in 2015 and you've made changes to it and you migrated in 2022, you're going to see everything from 2022 on. You're not going to see all of that. That was way too much information to put on the system. Um, you have the Classic audit reports. Um, in your EIS CD to support that information. So, but anything that's been done in inventory since then is going to show up on the auto report. And I, I do have that noted down here as well. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna try to run an auto report from what something that we did yesterday, maybe. So let me go and Grab the audit report here. And I'm going to put in one of the tag numbers we did yesterday. I think that was one of them. And, I'm, and I do, like I said, I have to put in um, an actual um, date in here. So I'm just going to pick on yesterday's date, too, because I know I did this yesterday. I'll do it through today. Um, select my report type. 
Um, I'm not going to put in a report type. I just want to see everything about this tag. Um, and then if I had um, a certain user, I could put that on here. Certain sort options, I could put that on here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just generate this. And so here is the actual tag that I entered yesterday. And it tells me who entered it, <clears throat> um, the operation. So just to kind of talk about what we're seeing here. Um, when I created that item, that bus, I created an item record and an acquisition record. Um, if I went and made changes to it, I should be able to see that stuff on here as well. Um, so just to kind of look at what we're seeing here, it's telling me the operation was add, and it was under the inventory item type. Um, here's the tag number, and then it goes in here and shows me what the old value was, which is zero, not nothing. I didn't have anything before this, and what the new value is. So it you know pulls all of that information in here. Um, anything that I basically entered will be in here. Now I also so. This is me going in and creating the item. And I, I'm looking at the timestamp too, 2.13.56. I see a 2.30, so that's 10 minutes you know, or so later, 20 minutes later. Um, but I do see a 2.13.56 in here as well. This is the acquisition that was added at the same time that the item was created. So again, it's showing me all the information from my pending file that I pulled in. Um, and uh, displays all of that as well. Um, if I went in then and you know modified this or added an additional um, acquisition, which I did, if you recall, I changed it. My amount was 84,000 and I increased it to 85,000. So I created an additional acquisition to that existing item. Well, this is my first one. And then my second one is right here, is by going in and creating an additional, so here's the 84,000. So that was tied to my original item entry. And then here's the one I did at 230. Um, I did that you know, about 17 minutes later. Um, and it is the thousand dollars that I put in. Okay, so, um, so it's basically showing me, you know, I created an item and then I updated the item. Now, because I updated the acquisition um, by adding that additional $1,000, that's going to update the original cost as well because I told it to. So if I go and see the other 230 time frame, here is my original cost being updated on the item record from 84000 to 85000 So hopefully that kind of helps to see how that took place. Um, and like I said, I went in and just used the specific tag number to do that. If I wanted to report by, you know, I guess a good example is the district says they closed out um, and, you know, they're having some problems and, you know, you want to go in and look to see run an audits report as to, you know, they're closing out. Well, the closing out is going to be recorded on the fiscal year grid, right? So you would go on underneath the report type and select fiscal year and try to put in, you know, a specific date range um, if you want to, um, to kind of gauge, you know, what may have happened. Maybe they closed it and reopened it several times. You'll be able to tell that by going in and selecting fiscal year, um, putting in a date range, and then reviewing that. And we added um, some improvements to the audit report. Um, one thing that was missing this last year is the actual fiscal year showing. It was showing a year being open and closed, but it didn't identify the year. So we made an improvement so that it's easy to see what years were opened, what years were closed, what years were made current. Um, so um, that was a, a nice improvement. So do you have any questions regarding 
the audit report. If not, I do want to talk about, we're going to wrap things up with the book value and the fiscal year and report bundles here. Um, the book value. So again, as we were talking about comparing the schedule change and depreciation with the book value, it's because the book value contains all the depreciation information. Um, so you can generate it for capitalized and non-cap. So obviously you would pick the capitalized option when you're comparing it to the schedule change and depreciation. There's a lot of different sort options in here. We've done a lot of work on the book value in the last year in order to get things, you know, to show um, properly, um, to emulate, you know, how the book value was working in Classic. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind, um, the fiscal year does default to the current year. So in my uh, test instance, I'm in 2024. Um, so it's going to show 2024 when I run um, the um, report. So that means life to date will be everything up through 2023, the end of 2023. And fiscal to date depreciation will include all 2024 values. Um, can I go in and run it from a prior year? Can. And it should reflect the figures from that year. Um, also, one thing you could do, because I know the book value allows you to put in a date for those um, reports that don't, like the gap reports where you can't put in a year, but you want to run a report from the prior year, all you need to do is change the current period to the prior year period, and then you can run those gap reports, and it will reflect what the figures were as of that time period. So, um, and then I just have uh, a note down here about the book value, comparing it against the fixed asset by function class, because it's got book value figures on there, and the schedule change in depreciation. So, if I just go in and look at the book value here, let's talk about it a little bit. So again, you've got your entity IDs that you can put in here. We added this this year, um, disposition start and stop date. So if you just want to see what was disposed of during this year, um, that is something that um, I think the auditors have requested as well. So they can pair that against uh, one of the other reports to balance. Um, and like I said, my current year is 2024. That's going to be reflected here. Um, my specific, I can put a specific tag. Um, I can put in fund type, specific funds if I wanted to, the different statuses. Um, I can select as many as I want. If I'm trying to compare this with some of the gap reports, I mean to make sure that it says capitalized and not both. Um, and then I've got the different sort options down here. One thing too we did with several of our reports um, this year is we added the ability to generate it in PDF and CSV. So we added the CSV option to a lot of our reports. So um, uh, that's been very helpful for those that want to pull this stuff into a spreadsheet. Um, so basically, you know, this is the book value. And I know I have some book values already out here that I generated. So let me pick on some of these. Here is one that I ran that this bigger here that I ran for the current year um, and that um, it is sorted I believe by asset class and it's capitalized so um, capitalized assets only so I could take this and I could compare this to a schedule of change and depreciation um, uh, buy and sort that by asset class and my totals do a control F to do a search. And it's going to take me to those uh, totals and I can compare what's sitting on here and like my total depreciation should match the total depreciation I'm seeing on that schedule change in depreciation based on how I ran this report. Um, and so, you know, this is just an example. And just to kind of talk about 
what you're seeing here um, and the way that this book value looks like, um, it's going to include the function code, the asset class, the location. Um, if there is an entity ID, it's labeled on here. Um, the method that was used for that item for depreciation, which I believe most districts use straight line, the beginning depreciation date, um, the actual original cost, uh, salvage value, if the item has salvage value, and we'll get into this when we talk about depreciation tomorrow, uh, the current life today, the current fiscal today. So when you're thinking about that schedule change in depreciation, where we got the beginning balance, that would be your life to date. And then we've got the continuing items, that would be your year to date. Um, the percentage of the depreciation that's been calculated so, so far. So, you know, when we look at this, the original cost is $13,500. Uh, the total depreciate, you know, so far, 66 of it has been depreciated. So we still have 52% left to depreciate. Here's our total depreciation, which is life to date plus year to date. And then here's the book value, which should be original cost minus total depreciation to equal our book value. And then this last figure is just showing us the last year that this is going to be uh, depreciated. Um, so obviously, if we disposed of this asset before then, you know, that'll remove it. But I, you know, it's nice just to have all of these columns and all this information on here. Um, it's a great report to basically show you where this item is at in regards to its depreciated value. Any questions about the book value report? And just a couple other things here too. Um, a schedule of change in fixed, I was gonna like pick on my depreciation ones here. I've got a schedule of change in depreciation from 2024 here. And I don't know if I have, and I've got a schedule of change in depreciation from 2023. So if I pull up the 2023, you know, and I ran these separately, and um, so this is my 2023. It tells me that because it says it up here. Um, and so basically, I made this 2023 current and I ran the report by asset class. And the ending balances on here should match my beginning balances on the 2024 one that I ran, which I did. And here's my 2024. So again, here's my 2023. I'll do a quick snippet of this. Let's see what I'm talking about here. So I'm just going to pick on the ending depreciation values. And then I'm going to look at my schedule of change from 2024 right here and pull up my snippet. And the beginning depreciation amounts from the 2024 should match my ending depreciation amounts. So you can see here. And they all do. Um, and those are the type of things that um, the auditors are going to be checking as well to make sure that there isn't anything that would have affected these. Um, Okay. So any other, and you know, we'll get into, into more into depreciation um, tomorrow. Um, and we'll talk about some other scenarios with depreciation. Um, but um, the last thing I wanna cover today is the fiscal year and report bundle. Um, and, you know, just, you know, if you, you know, have been having problems with this or they haven't been generating. Um, these are the type of things um, that need to kind of be looked at to make sure that things are running okay. Um, obviously, the report bundle is triggered when a period is closed. Um, and it does create like a zipped file. So that zipped file is going to contain 
all those fiscal year and reports. And we have all of those reports listed under our fiscal year and report bundle. I've got a, a link here um, that shows every report and how it's being run. Um, but it's all zipped up in PDF format only. Um, and then as long as the email uh, configuration is set up, so an email address has to be specified in core configuration, and the email configuration must be done underneath system configuration. Those have to be set up beforehand in order for that report bundle to be emailed out. Um, and like I said, you know, once document store is in place, it's um, going to send that fiscal year and report bundle to an inventory file archive. I'm assuming it's going to be similar to what USAS and payroll have in their file archives. Um, and so districts will be able to see that information in the inventory UI. Um, and obviously any of those districts that have been on inventory that have been saving their fiscal year and report bundles, um, they'll have the ability to um, send those into document store as well as, as any EISCD archived reports will eventually be able to be imported into the document store as well. So um, no need to worry about those reports that have already been generated, whether they did it in, in Classic or whether they've been running those report bundles in um, inventory, they'll be able to get that information imported in. Um, uh, one other thing um, regarding the audit report, it is based on system dates, the timestamp similar to the way it was in Classic. It's not by whatever date you entered in on the transaction. So, um, so if there was, you know, this doesn't happen a whole lot, and it seems like it only really happens if the district may be migrated over, but they haven't done anything in inventory since then, and it could be a year or so later. Um, so, like I said, when um, everything migrates over, audits is not going to pull in the activity from Classic. It can't. Um, so it's only going to record activity, um, time-stamped activity, as of when they started running things in inventory and did processing in inventory. So if there's uh, a problem with um, that the audit report is blank, um, it didn't generate uh, for some reason. It could be based on if they didn't do anything yet in inventory for that um, report um, So and for that time period. So that's just something to keep in mind. That's why I kind of noted that down here. So um, these last couple slides is in regards to um, the report bundle and if there are issues as to why it didn't generate or it wasn't emailed. Um, so these are things to check. Um, obviously you wanna check, first thing you wanna check is to make sure that the email configuration, email addresses are accurate, correct, and it's been set up. Um, also, uh, when you do uh, generate the report bundle, when it closes, your closes and it generates, um, does it appear on the job scheduler? So there is a job schedule area. Um, go back here. And there's a job schedule area here that um, will display if it's, you know, what's going on with that fiscal year end report bundle, if it's currently in progress or if it's completed. So you want to check that out to make sure, um, you know, what is the status of that? Um, also, uh, you might want to check out core fiscal years to see, you know, when you close, is that year now showing as closed? Um, so obviously, when you look at it, um, it should show false under the open column to show that it did close properly. Uh, one thing that we have seen from tickets is um, it seems to be some of them that it might be an, an issue with the audit report. If um, it's the audit report that is causing the report bundle not to generate. So run a separate audit report 
for the fiscal year to see if it generates on its own, if it runs, if it completes, if it doesn't, that could be an issue. Um, and also um, make sure that the emails aren't blocked. Um, so it may be due to this large size of the zip file. You know, districts have been on inventory for a couple of years here now that, you know, that audit report, some of the stuff could be very large depending on what they're entering in. Um, so you just want to make sure that there's no issues regarding the email. Um, so this just kind of shows you some of the things that you can check beforehand. And um, so, you know, before you create a ticket um, to SSDT, you know, look at that stuff that was in that prior slide. Also check the memory allocated, um, you know, generate the inventory application log. And it's really important to do it right after they let you know that it's not generating or they're having issues with it. We want that log file from that day. Um, usually when it received that, that may restart. And then if you give us the log file the following day, it may not have anything on there. So try to get the log file, the application log file and the database log file immediately after the district reports that issue. Um, right now for some of these, I know we've had a couple, you know, a few tickets where we aren't able to determine yet why the report bundle didn't complete. Um, and, you know, the only workaround we have at this point um, is for the districts to generate the reports individually. And that's where um, all of that is listed in our fiscal year and documentation bundle. Let me go to that. It's not let me. I'll use this way. And I'll go to our reports and I'll go down to our report bundle. And down here is the listing of all the reports and how they are run. Um, so if, you know, if some of the reports did generate in the report bundle, but some didn't, or if none of them did, um, they do have the ability for a workaround for now, not ideal, um, to generate these individually and follow the, the um, options in here in order to generate them for the year. Okay. I'm using the PowerPoint more today than I thought I was going to. <laughs> but I guess because there was just a, a lot of good information in here that um, referenced, uh, you know, especially the behind the scenes on the reports um, that we just can't see when we go into the UI. Um, but that's all I had for today um, regarding the reports. Hopefully some of those tips there, especially with the report bundle are helpful for you. Um, and I finished somewhat earlier than yesterday, so that's good. Um, tomorrow, we will be covering um, depreciation. So for those of you that are gluttons for punishment and want to stick around tomorrow, you can. Um, we're going to talk about depreciation and really, you know, hone in on um, the different options um, that you can depreciate. And then we're gonna go into the migration imports for new districts. I know, like, you know, I said yesterday, you probably have districts that didn't migrate over um, that wanna start new on inventory. And I just want to cover what we have in the documentation in regards to that and how important it is to follow it in order and explain why you're doing some of the things in there that you're doing. Um, so we'll go into that tomorrow. Otherwise, if you guys don't have any questions, I think we're good for today. You guys have a great rest of your day, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you.